Welcome uh, to our second speaker, Danielle Bertero, for our session from the domestication and diversification of quinoa to present day water and nitrogen use efficiency at the International Quinoa Research Symposium. Dr. Bertoro studied biology at the University of uh, Cordoba in Argentina with a PhD thesis in agricultural sciences at the University of Buenos Aires, where he worked on quinoa's photoperiod and temperature responses. For almost 30 years, he has been working as faculty of, of agronomy at the University of Buenos Aires and the National Research Council on several aspects of quinoa ecophysiology, seed physiology, germplasm collection and characterization, and genotype by environment interaction patterns. His research group has been able to identify sources of pre harvest sprouting resistance, which are being introduced into breeding lines. In addition to showing that quinoa grown in highly productive environments is limited by its capacity to produce more seeds, more than by the capture of resources, thereby opening the door to the manipulation of reproductive partitioning to increase yield potential. Daniel has contributed to safeguarding Argentina's local genetic resources together with the knowledge needed for its exploitation and management. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bertoro for this great session. Thank you, Laura. Um, this is the second time I participate in the quinoa meeting organized by Washington State University. It's a great pleasure to be there again. Uh, at that time, it was an intense period of a lot of discussion and exchange between the people who was there. Uh, before I start my, my presentation, uh, what I want to say is that I'm not going to show results of our research. Uh, this is part of a review. So I use data from other people's work and a significant part of the data I use for today's presentation comes from undergraduate student teaching in different countries of the Andes. And what, why do I want to say this? Because these were very good research uh, studies and they have not been published, so I'm really happy to be able to share their results. So, going back to my presentation, as you see in the title, the question I'm trying to answer is whether quinoa is efficient in the use of water and nitrogen. Uh, we work with quinoa and we know from research that quinoa is regarded as an efficient crop, most in the use of water. We'll speak about nitrogen later. And when you speak to farmers, they will say that quinoa is the species which use less water than other crops. But uh, the research we know mostly has been done at the plant physiology level. And today we want to show what we see when we go to the crop level of understanding. And uh, how did I start with this? Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to travel to China, to Shanghai in particular to have a sabbatical, stay there, to do some experiments at the Plant Stress Center. The Plant Stress Center belongs to the Chinese Academy of Science. And I uh, had to wait for the plants to, to grow, and then I had time to write a book chapter. I was asked to write a book chapter uh, about quinoa physiology. And this book chapter is going to be part of this book, uh, this book is going to be the third edition. It's called Crop Physiology. It's pretty known for the people in the in the area. But for the first time, uh, if you look to the the right bottom side, uh, you see a photo of quinoa growing in South Bolivia. So and that means that quinoa can be in the book speaking about major crops. So I think most of us will be happy <laughs> to see that is happening. And that is also in parallel to what is going on with quinoa in the world today. Uh, to start with my part, uh, we are perhaps pretty familiar with this kind of slide in which we have different levels of organization. They will have different disciplines and each discipline is based on a particular level or range of level of organization. So when we speak in terms of plant physiology, usually we are speaking about plants growing in pots, 
and look at a process at the plant level or maybe at the organ level like leaf or maybe at most basic levels like uh, tissues or even smaller levels. But when we speak about crop physiology, we are looking at the crop. That means we are trying to study and understand what happens with the population of pretty homogeneous uh, plants of the same species growing in a rather homogeneous environment, which is crop. So that's the difference between what is plant physiology and what is crop physiology. So crop physiology is some way in between what is physiology on one, on one side and what is ecology on the other side. Before doing this, writing this chapter, I went to Google Scholar and look for information about quinoa in the last almost 20 years. And then these are the results just for writing quinoa. As you see, there has been a steady increase in the number of publications with time. And if you look at the arrow, you see that marks the year when the International Year of Quinoa was celebrated. I seen that in some way that contributes to the increase in the number of publications. So that is for quinoa as a whole. But then when you go to physiology, um, particularly to the different stresses to which quinoa is faced, you see how those papers are distributed by subject. So most of the papers related to quinoa physiology and stress comes when you write drought or water. So there are more than 150 papers published on quinoa from that period. Second comes salinity, third comes nitrogen, and then you have temperature and heat, and to the right you have the combination of these different stresses so as usual there is less information about this combination of stresses but if we think that quinoa was a species which was pretty much unknown 30 or 40 years ago for science today we have a lot of information so quinoa became a model plan for water stress responses it became a model plan for salinity responses and then going to the, the crop level, this is a photo from an experiment which is being going on right now in, in, in China. Uh, I will divide my talk into two parts. First, we'll speak about water, and in the second part, we'll speak about nitrogen, and I will finish just with some comments about how we can make some progress in dealing with these two stresses. Uh, this photo is from Buenos Aires, and this is what water means for us. So in Argentina, water regularly means a lot of water, at least in the part of the country where I live. Uh, usually for quinoa, we think in terms of water for water stress. For us, the problem with quinoa is not the lack of water, but the excess of water. But this is not what I'm going to speak about right now. How do we approach water from an eco-physiological perspective? Uh, this equation was posed by a scientist from Australia uh, almost 40 years ago. His name, his name is John Pascura. And he used this equation. So he divides the different components related to water and affecting yield in terms of first the amount of water which is used by the crop, which is crop evapotranspiration. Second comes the proportion of that water use which is used as transpiration, so what the crop effectively use. Then comes the transpiration efficiency, which is the ratio between the biomass accumulation by the crop and the water transpiration of the crop. And finally, we have harvest index. So this is the approach I'm going to use for this presentation when speaking about water. French and Schultz were two scientists, Australian scientists, and uh, took the task of analyzing how yield is affected by the availability of water. And these papers were published in the 80s, so some time ago. And the novelty of what they did is that they define what's called yield boundary to the response of yield to water. And it shows 
order the role or the place of the relevance of water in limited yield in place where we used to say that they are places where water lived here. And this is a kind of circular <laughs> uh, one, but the point of this is this. If you look at a figure like this one, this is uh, the relationship between yield and crop evapotranspiration for quinoa, uh, the relationship between any two points is also called water productivity, which is the relationship between yield and uh, water use. There is a maximum slope of 13.3 kilos of grain per millimeter of water use. So that is our maximum response. That is the limit we get today for quinoa. All other points are points that for, for several reasons are not directly related to the limit posed by water. That can be disease problem, can be frost problem, can be mismanagement of water, of sowing dates, uh, etc. And uh, another measure coming from this relationship is that the idea that quinoa use little water does not seem to apply to all conditions. If you look at the right, you see some points with very, very high water use. And uh, in the box to the, to the right, what is shown is values for this maximum slope, what's called a water limited yield, for crops like sunflower, maize, and wheat. So for sunflower is around eight kilos per hectare, for maize is around 42, and for wheat, here there are results for wheat in Australia, for wheat in the United States. So as you can see, save for sunflower, the values for quinoa, are pretty low. When we analyze uh, how these points are distributed in geography, what you can see is that the maximum values are those coming from temperate environments. In particular, these come from experiments which were run in Denmark in the spring, summer, and in Morocco in from the autumn to the spring. So those are the maximum values we get. And if you look at the right, you can see results from Iran. Uh, this comes from one experiment which was run in the summer there and the very high temperature under irrigation. And this crop used more than 1,000 millimeters in crop evapotranspiration. And of that, around 1,000 was used by quinoa in transpiration. That's a lot of water. So with that water, Kino was able to produce on average about three tons. But three tons we were pretty much expensive in terms of the use of water. And finally, most of the points below the one uh, ton value come from Andean countries. So it shows that something is going on in the Andes, making the quinoa crop not able to use the water which is available to the crop as well as it could be used. So the question is, uh, as the question says here, who are we going to blame? So according to the, the equation, it can be related to the partitioning of water to transpiration, can be related to transpiration efficiency, and could be related to harvest index. Today, I will just speak about transpiration efficiency. And this slide shows the relationship between transpiration efficiency and crop evapotranspiration. Again, I will remind that transpiration efficiency means how much biomass we produce per unit of water use. And why did I use crop evapotranspiration? What we should do is like in the figure to the upper right side of the slide. Those are results for wheat. We, what we have is water use efficiency, which is the same to transpiration efficiency against vapor pressure deficit. So the, the, the water demand of the atmosphere, because it's pretty well known that the higher the demand of the atmosphere, the lower the uh, water use efficiency. In the case of wheat, it goes from around 80 kilos 
square millimeter to around a little bit more than 20 kilos. In the case of quinoa, we have that information just for a few crops, a few experiments, sorry, but we can trust that basically the relationship we see here is pretty much related also to variation in the water demand of the atmosphere. And it can be seen that the values of transpiration efficiency go from around 30 or 35 kilos to around 10 or maybe less kilos. So uh, again, as in the yield against vapor transpiration uh, uh, relationship, which is shown previously, the best results are those coming from the north of Europe and Morocco and the worst conditions are the ones we get uh, to the right in Iran, but also in the, in the Andes. When we compare these uh, values from quinoa with the average values of other crops, what we see is this, that the transpiration efficiency here is shown for wheat, maize, rice, sunflower, and uh, canola, also named colza. The values for quinoa in all areas are close to rice, sunflower, or canola, but they can be pretty low, and as I showed before, much lower than those from, uh, from wheat under some conditions. So the point is, do we uh, insist or do we focus on water use efficiency in quinoa? Uh, that's an open question, but I want to show these results. These results come from uh, experiments done by Juan Gonzalez and his team in Tucumán. And to the left, uh, what is shown is the relationship between photosynthesis and the time of the day for several quinoa cultivars, most of them coming from the highlands in Bolivia and Peru. And what is seen is that while some of these uh, varieties are able to keep higher photosynthesis uh, during the day, some of them are not able to do that. So photosynthesis go down around midday. And to the right, what is seen is the, uh, is the relationship between photosynthesis and uh, leaf uh, co conductance. And uh, these values are for midday. And what came out of this uh, paper is that those varieties which were able to maintain photosynthesis through high leaf conductance, which also means that they would have higher transpiration rate, were also the ones which have the higher leaves and the higher biomass. And what is particular of this experiment is it, is it was not done under full irrigation. There was some limitations to water availability. And even so, the ones which were able to use more water were the ones which finally were more productive. And that brings as to uh, one paper which was published several years ago by a person named Abraham Bloom. And the title of his paper is perhaps the effective use of water and not water use efficiency is what matters in terms of productivity of crops under drought stress. And uh, there are other services uh, of transpiration. We are working on this right now, but basically if a plant has a higher transpiration rate, then also have a higher cooling capacity, has lower temperatures, and that can also help uh, to improve the productivity of plants under hot conditions. And that is part of research we are doing right now. So my second part of my research is related to nitrogen. The approach we use to nitrogen is based in these two equations. So yield can be understood in terms of uh, the amount of nitrogen, which is uptake, the nitrogen uptake of a crop, the nitrogen harvest index, which is the proportion of the nitrogen which goes to the seed, and finally the percent of nitrogen in the grain. If we use the same information, then we can estimate which is called nitrogen uptake efficiency and also is called physiological efficiency in other papers, which is the relationship between yield and nitrogen uptake. And if we do that, the, this efficiency depends on two factors. On the one hand, the nitrogen harvest index, the higher the harvest index of nitrogen, the higher the efficiency, and on the other hand, the percent of nitrogen or protein in the seed. In this case, the higher the content of nitrogen, the lower the efficiency. Using the information from the Fresel publication, I was able to uh, make this figure in which what is shown is the relationship between yield and nitrogen uptake in, uh, in, in the black cycles. This is the first time 
uh, we have this relationship for Kino, so we are happy that there was information to do that. Some of the points are below the, the, the top value, so this is also a kind of boundary response. And on the right hand of the figure, what is shown is the nitrogen utilization efficiency, and this is shown by triangles. So for Kino, I can go for um, 60 kilos of fuel per kilo of nitrogen uptake to less than 20. So when we move from less fertility to high fertility, there is a strong decrease in the efficiency of use of nitrogen by quinoa. If we uh, go to the first component of this relationship, this shows the relationship between nitrogen utilization efficiency and nitrogen harvest index. There is a very strong relationship, and the arrow shows that when we go from lower productivity to higher productivity, the nitrogen harvest index decreased strongly and also does the nitrogen utilization efficiency. If we go to the second component of this efficiency, then this is the relationship with grain nitrogen concentration. There is a tendency, the tendency is still significant, but it's pretty weak. And this other figure shows the relationship between nitrogen utilization efficiency and grain protein concentration and the high productive environment for several crops. This is information from the literature. And then we have maize, uh, we have wheat, we have sunflower, and we have soybean. And we have also quinoa. So there is a general negative relationship, which is what we expect uh, as we increase the protein content of the seed, the minimum values then are those for soybean, but soybean has around 80% of its nitrogen in the seed. The other crops have between 70 and 75%, but in high productive environments, the value for quinoa are around 50%. So quinoa under high nitrogen availability has a limit to translate the availability it gets from the soil into the nitrogen which goes to the seed and we can call that the nitrogen harvest index gap. If we increase this gap we can keep the protein concentration of quinoa but increase the efficiency and also we can increase the other. So where we go from here so what's next and the you know, quinoa is grown today in many countries, so there are new environments, perhaps we need new ideas. Or maybe we can borrow some old ideas for a new crop like quinoa. We have done something related to, to that. These slides shows the relationship between yield and growth per plant after flowering, coming from several experiments. The one, the, 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 arrow, the line shows the one to one relationship. And what is seen here is that the higher the growth, the lower the proportion of that growth which goes to yield. So uh, when you analyze the limitation for yield, this is called a sink limitation. So there is a limit capacity to translate higher growth in higher yield. And one way to solve it is to do the same which was done during the green revolution in other crops which is to manipulate the geodetic acid metabolism in a crop like quinoa so uh, the, we did an experiment this experiment was published by a student named Gomez her surname and she applied paclobutazole paclobutazole is a geodetic acid uh, synthesis uh, inhibitor and see that at the beginning of reproductive growth and this photo shows how the control plants and those treated with paclobutrazole look uh, at the end of flower. So a lot of biomass went to the panicle and that biomass came from the biomass of the shoot as in, in, in other crops. So this also was related to the a high increase in harvest index and final yield of this material, but it had another benefit. And the benefit was that also roots grew bigger 
under paclobutazol. So maybe we have a win-win situation. So we can have a higher yield on one side, but also we have a higher capacity for root exploration in a crop with quinoa if we work on manipulating the direct acid synthesis or uh, sensitivity of a crop like quinoa. So to finish my presentation, which are the main message and question coming from this? Uh, first, we could increase yield response to water and nitrogen if we increase yield potential. And also, if we manipulate geographic acid, perhaps there's also a benefit in terms of root growth. Second, that we need to solve the crop versus plant and leaf level trepidation efficiency puzzle. So I'm not saying that the result from physiological spread are wrong, but there's something which is not seen in the same way when we, we go to the crop. This data come from different genotypes growing in different environments, so we need to pay more attention to genetic variability. Third, we need to work on filling this water and nitrogen limited yield gap. So perhaps not focus so much in the upper level, but what we can do in between. That's what many farmers and breeders have been doing for other in other crops, so this is not new. Four is very important that we increase nitrogen harvest index under high nitrogen. And finally, we need to do more research and focus on breeding on nitrogen. About nitrogen, we really know very little, mostly related to fertilization response. So uh, thanks for your attention. And now I'm ready to answer the questions which come out from this presentation.